Let me add my uh, word of welcome to you who are on the campus and looking things over. I uh, understand how you feel. We have all been there at one time in our lives, and you are seeking the mind of God. That's a big decision for you. And uh, I want to encourage you to take your time and uh, make that selection very carefully. Uh, it's, it's a long journey, and it's a rugged journey. It's difficult on purpose because ministry has its difficult times as well. This is great training for that. With all of that in mind, I want to begin by saying that all of us have uh, shadows from our past. Uh, those shadows have a way of haunting us and, if we're not careful, immobilizing us even paralyzing us for whatever it is God may have in mind for us in his service. And that's true of everyone sitting out here in this uh, gathering of students and potential students. It's certainly true of me, and it is true of every person sitting on this platform. We are imperfect human beings, uh, having been born of imperfect parents and all the way back to ancient days, all the way back to Adam. Because that is true, if you're not careful, you will miss God's best for you. So that's sort of the theme of what I have in mind and with that in mind, I want to mention on the front end three of the very common perils that accompany us in life. And I have in mind those of us who are ever aware of the failures of our past. Here's the first one. And they all grow out of the stress created by knowing how imperfect we are. First is the problem of intensity. And intensity could be described as rushing ahead before we are sent. We've all done that. Rushing ahead before we have been sent. That's a problem related to intensity. And second, I would think, would be insecurity. The battles with insecurity brought on by retreating after we have failed. And we've done that as well. Some of you quite likely are in a retreat mode. Uh, you have blown it. You have made a serious mistake or maybe a series of mistakes like that. And you have chosen to retreat. And you wonder if you'll ever really be used in any significant way. I understand those feelings. The third, and perhaps the most plaguing of the three, is inadequacy. Inadequacy. And that would be described as resisting when we are called. Resisting when we are caught, rushing ahead before we are sent, and then retreating after we have failed, only to discover that God's plan for us is, is a magnificent plan filled with hope, but we resist it out of inadequacy even when we sense he's calling us. It was... It was uh, F.B. Meyer, one of the pastors of yesteryear in Great Britain, written a number of biographical works as well as devotional uh, literature, who wrote, This is the bitterest of all, to know that suffering need not have been. That it is the result of one's own inadequacy and inconsistency. That it is the harvest of one's own sowing. That the vulture which feeds on the vitals 
is a nestling of one's own rearing. Aren't those great words? And then adds, ah me, this is pain. This is pain. Quite likely in a gathering of this size, there are some of you who uh, can identify with that statement. And as a result, you will have little difficulty understanding the struggle Moses had when he stood before the burning bush. So I'll invite your attention to this section of scripture in the Old Testament. Rather than going right to the the day of that call, I'd like to look at the days that preceded it. And if you'll hold your place at the end of Exodus chapter 2 and locate Acts chapter 7, you'll have a good parallel in the scriptures to correlate the story. The thing I like about Stephen's testimony in Acts 7 is that he he gives us a a chronological uh, milestone along the way in Moses' life. For example, hold your place in uh, Exodus, we'll we'll sort of go back and forth to begin with. And look at Acts 7, uh, verse 20. We'll read along here and get the chronology. And it was at this time that Moses was born. He was lovely in the sight of God, and he was nurtured three months in his father's home. And after he had been exposed... That would include that journey and the little ark across a part of the Nile where the daughter of Pharaoh found him. Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Look at this next verse. You who are interested in higher learning and are pursuing that as a possibility in your graduate school studies. Look at verse 20. 22. Moses was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. He was a man of power in words and deeds. And when he was approaching the age of 40, so from verse 20 down through the early part of 23, he is, he is from birth to 40, okay? In fact, as you read that same account over in Exodus, you, you read when, when he was grown or having grown up. So Stephen gets even more specific. He's approaching the age of 40. It entered his mind to visit his brethren, that would be the Hebrews, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him. And took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. The fact is he murdered him. He killed the Egyptian. And then uh, uh, he he thought that uh, that would be understood by the fellow Hebrews. In fact, it says so here. when he saw one of them being mistreated, he, he struck him down and he supposed his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. Interesting thought here that you may not have pondered before. Uh, I think Moses, in some sense, had the understanding at some time before age 40 that he would be involved in the delivering of the people from Egyptian bondage. That's certainly what that is saying. He thought they would understand that he was engaged in the deliverance. And, of course, they didn't understand. Moses hides this man he has murdered in the sand and uh, soon is found out. So he makes a, a, a dreadful mistake. To go back to earlier words, he rushes ahead before he is sent. And in, 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 in the energy of the flesh... He takes the life of this Egyptian. And there begins a a series of troubles for him. Now notice in verse 23, when he was approaching the age of 40, this happened. 
And then you get down to uh, uh, verse, verse 27, or verse 26. On the following day, he appeared to them as they were fighting together, and he tried to reconcile them in peace. So there's a fight that breaks out uh, among the uh, uh, Hebrews. He said, men, your brethren, why do you injure one another? The one who was injuring his neighbor pushed him away, saying, who made you a ruler or just or, uh, and, and judge over us? Uh, you do not mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday, do you? And the remark, at that remark, Moses fled and became an alien in the land of Midian. So he's now 40. Before he is 40, these things have transpired. He's gotten this great education in Egypt. He has been reared by Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, he is, he's wearing the garments. He knows the language. He is fluent of course, in, in Egyptian, he is, he, he is on his way quite likely to becoming a Pharaoh as he is being reared by Pharaoh's daughter. And then out of the blue, in a rash moment, he murders a Hebrew. And as a result of fear, he flees and becomes an alien. Look at verse 30. And after 40 years had passed. So now he's age 80. 80. I want you to keep all of that in mind when you go back to Exodus chapter 2 because it, 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 it plays off of those details. Stephen gives the uh, age, and I, I like that. That helps us set, the, set our minds on those, uh, on those uh, eras in his life. So we, uh, we go back to a similar scene, verse 14. This is when it originally occurred. Who made you a prince or judge over us? Are you intending to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Moses was afraid. Uh, and uh, he is uh, saying, surely the matter has become known. And when Pharaoh heard of the matter, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from the presence of Pharaoh and settled in the land of Midian and sat down by a well. This is the Moses we meet in in chapter 3, 40 years later. So he comes to the Median Desert. He uh, meets up with uh, Jethro, becomes his father, uh, his son-in-law, marries Jethro's daughter, and then he keeps his father-in-law's sheep in the desert for 40 years. All of this education, all of this preparation, uh, and now he has become a Bedouin, if you will, uh, sort of a, a wandering nomad in the, in the uh, uh, desert of, of Midian, forgotten, obscure, uh, set aside, and convinced, I'm sure, by now, having played the scene over many times in his mind, as all of us do in low moments, realizing uh, his days are past. So much for deliverance, so much for a, a ministry. And I, I want to pause here and, and urge you to guard against that kind of thinking. Because you will, you will mark your life out while God does not do that. There's an old saying from the 19th century, the bird with a broken pinion will never fly as high again. That may be true of birds, but that is not true of people. The Bible is filled with people who failed miserably and then were used greatly. Uh, in fact, I think it was uh, Tozer who said, it's doubtful God can use anyone greatly until he has hurt him deeply. And if you have been hurt, if you have been wounded, if you have caused wounds to others, uh, you are right there in that category. And who hasn't? Who hasn't? We learn to cover that up. We don't look like it. We don't talk about it. Uh, faculty members don't come out and tell you all of their uh, flaws. Uh, you're around them a while. You see some. And, and you get to know them better. You realize they're just human beings like the rest of us. Uh, and, and, and they qualify as those God is using, even though they have in their past times of failure bad mistakes, wrong decisions. They too, we too have rushed ahead when we weren't sent. We too have felt feelings of, of insecurity uh, and, and we, we've retreated like Moses at the well, 
It's kind of a sad scene in the end of verse 15 here in Exodus 2. He sat down by a well. Don't you wish you had his thoughts recorded for us in the next few verses? He has much to learn in the, uh, in the place of obscurity. And there he is. Verse 23 conclude, uh, includes the words, for in the course of those many days. Those are 40 years, in fact, have passed. So, now we're ready for chapter 3. Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness, and he came to Horeb, the mount, mountain of God. This is Sinai. He came to this, this mountain, 8,000 feet in elevation. He's at the base of this mountain leading these uh, woolies as he has done one day after another. It's just another day. In fact, a simple outline for what we're going to be dealing with would be a day, verse 1, a bush, <laughs> verses 1 to 10, a calling, which would be God's words to Moses to become his instrument for deliverance, and, of course, excuses. And there are four of them I want to point out, but now we are at the day. Days like this come, and, and they're never announced. They're never announced. Um, Sometimes they come as you're driving into the driveway at your home. Occasionally they come as you're walking up the steps of the school. You're either thinking of attending or you're now attending. Sometimes they come as you're sitting in a library. Sometimes they come in the middle of the night when you can't sleep. A day arrives that will be a turning point in your life, but it arrives unannounced. And I urge you to be sensitive for these kind of days. We all, again, we all have them. And there will be more. Moses thinks this is just another one of those, another one of those days. And all of a sudden, something occurs. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire. That was not unusual, by the way, in the hot Midian desert bushes sometime spontaneously burst into flame. They're dry, these little dry, thorny bushes that grow in that region. But what is remarkable is that the bush is not consumed. It keeps burning. It keeps burning. It continues to burn. And it catches his attention. It arouses his curiosity. And uh, Moses says, this is, he speaks to himself, I need to turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. Now, Moses has never read Exodus 2, okay? So he doesn't know what's coming, and uh, you don't know what's coming. And in the, in the midst of an unusual moment, if you're not careful, you'll, you'll rush right on by it, because you've rushed by it before. And you've already pretty much marked your own life out as not that useful for the Lord in light of your past, the stuff you've done, things you've said, mistakes you've made, sins you've committed. The guilt, the shame, and all of that stuff the enemy would keep stacking up in your mind. Moses has no idea. And suddenly, there's a voice that comes out of a bush that doesn't burn up. And it has his name, Moses, Moses. God did that with Abraham. Abraham, Abraham did it with Samuel. Samuel, Samuel. Moses, Moses. Now, all of a sudden... <laughs> In the middle of the desert, nobody around but sheep. He hears his voice and his response. I love this. If you read in the Hebrew, it's one little tiny word. And ain't he? Doesn't have to put his lips together. And ain't he? <laughs> I mean, when you've been with the Woolies for 40 years, you got a limited vocabulary. So you don't, you don't say a whole lot. Here am I. Send me. It's me. Some suggest it means at your service. 
or simply behold I I'm here it's like you answer in class when you're going through school elementary school here it's me and to his absolute amazement a plan is laid out that just blew him away remember his background Remember, he's 80, older than everybody here except two saint and Pentecost. <laughs> Nobody else is that old, okay? I'm close, but I'm not there yet. 80 years old. In this culture, over the hill, retire, get out of the way. There's no place for that in God's plan. And get that out of your mind. Some of your most effective years will be beyond the age of 70, beyond the age of 80. Should God's grace give you length of days. I mean, Moses is just now beginning to live. He's blown it up till now. And ain't he? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, don't you love that? When the Lord saw that he took notice, that he gave him his attention, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. The place on which you're standing is holy ground. And without a word, Moses reaches down and unties the thongs of his sandals and steps barefoot onto the sand as he hears, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Then Moses hid his face. He was afraid to look at God. Another reason he hid his face is that he had been so faithless before he was 40 and he remembered. He didn't know what to expect. This God has come back. Perhaps they weren't on much speaking terms. We know nothing of Moses from age 40 to 80, except that he kept the flock. Marries and has a couple of kids. Life sort of runs its course. And now the Lord says, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. I'm aware of their sufferings. I don't know how much Moses knew about it. There's no internet back then. There's no newspaper in the Median Desert. I don't know how much the word had traveled. He was certainly in a safe place away from the authority of the Pharaoh. So news of Egypt may not have come to him. Maybe all of this is brand new news. The next line blows him away. So... I've come down to deliver them. Remember that. Moses is never uh, commanded to deliver the people. That's God's job. Moses will be the instrument of deliverance. He will be the human voice of deliverance. He has no power. He won't act on his own. It all must come from the living God. Remember that, you who are students. Uh, and, and all involved in a culture that's all about you, all about us. In God's work, it isn't. He does the delivering. I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians to bring them up from the land to a good, uh, to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite, the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite, Jebusite and the termites, all of them, all those people are out there. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Okay, so far, history lesson. So far, that's what's happening. So far, that's current events. But now, he says, therefore come now, I will send you to Pharaoh. Just like you would do, or I would do, certainly at this age in my life, and at this stage, where I have done little more than rehearse my failures, that would shock me. 
I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. With this, resistance begins. We, are res we resist when we are called because we struggle with such feelings of inadequacy. The very first time I walked into Chafer Chapel, the summer of 1959, even though it was empty, no students were here, there were no summer classes back then, I walked in and instantly felt intimidated. I didn't come from a background of academia. I didn't have all the, all the stuff that regular students had that were coming in. I, I was hoping to be accepted on probation. And uh, I, I was, I was so grateful for that. But I remember walking in this chapel. I remember the first time we were in this chapel and we sang. In fact, I think we sang, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name which is our school song. And I remember uh, sitting here as a first year student uh, with tears. There's kind of a mixture of intimidation and awesome uh, respect and uh, fear, fear. I thought, uh, how on earth did all of this happen to somebody like me? How on earth could I have been accepted to be a part of this student body. And so I understand Moses, you understand Moses. Let's don't cluck our tongue at Moses at verse 11. Moses said to God, who am I? See, Moses still doesn't get it. Ministry isn't about you, it isn't about me. It's all about our God. So one of your major tasks as a minister of the gospel is to introduce the people God brings with you and before you and around you. Introduce them to God. Help them know the living God. The better they know the living God, the closer they will walk with him and the better will be their harmony and their intimacy with the Almighty. But Moses first responded, who, who am I? Remember me? I mean, 40 years ago, remember? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? Notice where his eyes are. Me, who am I that I should go, that I should bring them? You, you didn't hear me, God could have said. I've come down to deliver them. I just need a voice box. I need a, I need a warm body. I need somebody who will take the staff and, and, and do the work that I will carry on through him. I just need you to walk with me. And Moses said, who am I? Look at God's response, so gracious. Certainly I will be with you. This shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people, don't you love when? Not, we're gonna hope against hope. We really are gonna work on this and maybe we're gonna bring them. He says, when? When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. You'll be right back here. I will give you my word in written form. You will be right here. In fact, he says, you will worship God at this mountain. I want you to be a worshiper, Moses. Walk with me through this. Well, then Moses starts his excuses. And uh, I've listed four of them, okay? They're gonna sound awfully familiar. Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I shall say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me. <laughs> you put a lot of maze in your sentence when you're worried. These, it's all hypothetical. He hasn't even gone yet. He's already got a list whipped up on why he shouldn't be the one going. So his first excuse is, I will not have all the answers. I will not have all the answers. They may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. Introduce them to me. 
then get out of the way. Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Furthermore, God said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has sent me. And this is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. Go in my name. You may not have all the answers, but you'll have all of me. And you can count on that, men and women. There'll be so many times in ministry you will not have the answers. Uh, You will face situations that were not covered during your studies at this school. You will not find help in some book. You'll be hard pressed to find verses that you can use to claim. You'll be at the mercy of your God and he will come through. It's wonderful when he does. Moses has yet to learn that. So as soon as God finishes saying, you'll have all of me, Moses is ready with a second excuse. Chapter 4. Look at this. Moses answered and said, what if? There's a lot of what ifs in our sentences when we're worried. Now what if they will not believe me? Uh, Or listen to what I say. For they may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. This excuse runs like this. I may not have all their respect. I'm going to stand before these people and I'm going to tell them the Lord's delivering. And they might say, who who are you? Aren't you the one that killed that Egyptian? Aren't you the one Pharaoh ran out of town? If there are any who believe, who remember that. And so the Lord very graciously reveals to him that he will have all of his power. And the Lord shows him that by asking, what is in your hand? He says, a staff, throw it on the ground, threw it on the ground, became a serpent. Moses fled from it. He said, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail. He stretched out his hand, caught it, became a staff. All of this happens right in front of his eyes, right there with his own hands in touch. Verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. He gives them another sign. Moses has a third excuse, verse 10. Oh, this is so familiar. Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent. Neither recently nor in time past. You know what? That's not true. Stephen said he was mighty in word and deed. Moses has forgotten. Or maybe by now he has uh, cultivated a, his fear has made a, given him an impediment of speech. You know, like... Uh, the king's speech. And, and he says, I, 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 I'm, I'm not eloquent. I, I, I wish you would um, please remove from your mind any thought of needing to be eloquent. Those who have ministered me to me most effectively in my life have not been eloquent preachers. They've been faithful ministers of the word. They have been spokesmen for God who did their homework and presented the message of God in light of the needs in my life and others around me. But Moses has this thing on eloquence. Not before nor now. He says, I I am slow of speech and I am slow of tongue. You get that way. He's, you know, I've lost a step. I've stacked up 40 years in the past in the desert. I, I'm not able to stand and speak as you need someone to speak. I'm not your man. Now, sometime you aren't a good preacher. Sometime your gift is not preaching. 
And if it isn't, don't force it. You know, do us all a favor. Uh, if, if that isn't your gift, there are a lot of other areas of ministry away from and apart from the pulpit. So it's okay. When I was here, one of my profs in preaching said he had a young man just before our class that was convinced he was a preacher, and he wasn't. And uh, second year, worked with him, and he couldn't preach. Third year was almost worse. And he said, no, my mom sent me here, and she's convinced I ought to be a preacher, and I'm, I'm on my way, I'm going to be a preacher. He says, no, you say, you don't have the gift. You just don't, by the fourth year, he's still convinced. And finally, the prof worked up the courage to say, you may think you have the gift of preaching. Nobody around here has the gift of listening to you. Okay? <laughs> so if you, if, you, if you don't have a gift that is a part of a pulpit ministry and all that, don't force it. But Moses did. Moses was able to do it. He's just trying to talk God out of it, which is a, an impossibility. In fact, he says, I, I, I do not have all the ability. That's his excuse. And the Lord's answer is, you'll have all that's needed. In fact, look at verse 11. In case you have someone born into your home with congenital defects or difficulties of a physical or emotional nature, look at what this says. The Lord said, who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him dumb or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? We have a, a autistic grandson. It was a great day in my daughter's life when she found Exodus chapter four, verse 11. And uh, while we have a lot of mystery, in fact, right now they are at a doctor's office hoping to get some insight in how to, how to help our little 13-year-old Jonathan with his struggle with autism, which, by the way, is a growing uh, issue in our day. Uh, but it helps to remember that this was not an accident. She's no longer blaming herself for something or we for something. This is all part of God's plan. I make man's mouth, meaning no, Moses... Look at verse 12. Now go. I, even I will be with you. I'll be with your mouth. I will teach you what you are to say. Isn't that great? You, you prepare your life for what God has for you, and the Lord will be with your mouth. And so finally he finishes with, Please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you wish. In fact, I think that's a, not, a, not a great translation. I, I, I checked that, and I noticed that uh, various ones render it in various ways. Uh, the RSV says, send, I pray, some other person. The Living Bible says, Lord, please send someone else. The Berkeley version says, oh, Lord, please send anyone else. I think that might be the idea. Just send anybody. You know what the Lord said? I, you're my choice, but I'll, I'm going to use Aaron. Oh, no. Aaron became an albatross in his life. If only he had said, use my mouth, use my lips, take me, I'm yours. And with the staff in his hand and the power of God, verse 17, as his assistants, verse 18, Moses departed and returned to Jethro and said, Let me go, that I may turn, return to my brothers who are in Egypt. And, Mo, and he said, Go in peace. You don't know it, but you are on the verge of... Uh, of a magnificent future. You don't have any idea what that is, nor do I. If I knew, I would stop and tell each one of you so you would be filled with hope. The Lord's plan for you is beyond what you can even imagine. The same 25, 26-year-old guy that sat in this seat back in 59 would never have guessed what the next 50, 55 years would hold for him. I would have been the last. 
to declare that this would be true. I live my life surprised. I had people ask me, is part of the plan? I go, what plan? <laughs> you kidding? I plan about this far ahead. Lunch is in about 30 minutes. <laughs> I sometime look at the church God has raised up out there in the little old Frisco. It's where we used to go hunt dove when I was here as a student. A dump. I don't tell them it's a dump, but back then it was, a, it was like a dump. And uh, look at what it is today. And look at that church. Look at this ministry. Look at this stuff going out on the air. I mean... God's plan is magnificent. Dale Galloway in a great little book called Dream a New Dream tells a true story of a couple that owned a little mom and pop store in this small town. Well, for some reason, the population grew. The city annexed the town. And before long, there was urban renewal. And nobody offered to buy their little parcel of land. But to their left, there was this magnificent, huge discount store that was built. Huge store, almost a block around it. To the right was a huge uh, grocery store and hardware store combined. All of them selling for prices less than their little mom and pop store. And here they sat wondering what in the world they should do. The dad had a great idea. He got busy and painted a sign, put three words on it, stuck it on the front of their store, Main entrance here. <laughs> Pretty creative, huh? You think those gigantic things going on around you and that have gone on behind you have disqualified you? No. It's all part of God's plan. You're not in charge of your life. You're bought with a price. You serve the majestic God of heaven. He will use you in ways you right now could never guess. And when he does, tell me about it. I'll rejoice with you. If I'm not alive, Pentecost and Toussaint will still be alive. <laughs> Write them. Father, thank you for your faithfulness in spite of our lack of it. Thank you for your grace for chasing us down when we weren't wanting you or seeking you, for loving us when we were terribly unloving and unlovely, for using us when we were so without worth in ourselves. Thank you for your favor, your surprises, for taking us from the pit and putting us on a rock and establishing our going, putting a song in our mouth, even praise to our God. How we love you, Father, the God of Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, Isaac, Moses, and all of those great lives on whose shoulders we stand, how we love you. In the majestic name of Jesus, we reaffirm our commitment to you today. Everybody.